Welcome to episode number 161 of CXO Talk. I'm Michael Krigsman, and today we have a very interesting show. I'm talking with Scott Feinberg, who is the chief API architect, or I guess you're, you are the API architect at the New York Times. And we're going to talk about the role of APIs in supporting the core mission of the New York Times. Scott, how are you? Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm great. Thanks for having me. So, Scott, tell us, so you're, you're, the, chief, you're the API architect at the Times. Let's begin by, tell us what do you actually do? What does that mean? And tell us about the mission of the New York Times. Sure. So as the, as the API um, architect, um, uh, you know, my job is thinking about sort of how we manage um, APIs. Um, I spend most of my time uh, uh, working on systems to make APIs better um, at the times and uh, consulting with uh, teams on sort of how best to build their um, APIs, um, how, uh, um, how they should be going about um, integrating with them. Um, so it's really, you know, any team that uh, wants to um, build a service that works across a lot of different um, teams, um, I'll oftentimes come and help in whatever way, uh, way um, I can make sure their, uh, their, their um, services are uh, going to work well. So when you say you're building these services for the New York Times, what does that have to, that's, that's a basic, you know, our audience is business people. Totally. And so they may not even know in general what that is, or at least it, and certainly not at a detailed level, and certainly not how it connects to the running of the Times. So maybe explain that linkage to us. Totally. So uh, the New York Times um, at no other time in um, history has been such a digital company. Um, at the end of the day, like you think of us as this newspaper, but, uh, but at the end of the day, we're a digital content provider. And the paper is just another way that people get that um, that um, content. So, you know, we're on you know every platform you can think of. Um, there's the um, New York Times. Uh, we have uh, lots of different uh, digital um, properties. You know, we have a real estate um, section. We have a huge video team. Uh, you know, we're on um, iOS, some um, Android, um, on the web, everywhere. You know, the Times is, it wants to be there. You know, we have a huge cooking vertical now. Um, you know, uh, we're leveraging, you know, the 165 years worth of content um, and reworking that for a digital age where uh, not only are we on your doorstep, but we're in your house, we're with you when you're making food, we're helping you make, um, make those lifestyle um, decisions um, and the New York Times is always there in your um, pocket. Um, and uh, so as a digital um, organization, we're very much um, a technology company. Um, you know, there's 400 engineers who work um, at the Times. Um, and, you know, we're focused on, on building these amazing products and these um, experiences. But to do that, we, we look, you know, a lot more like... Um, like a Facebook or a Google than we do, say, you know, a Wall Street Journal. So digital is a fundamentally core part of what you're doing, and you have uh, a large group of people who are focused on that. So when you say that you're looking more like a Facebook or a Google than a Wall Street Journal, maybe can you elaborate on that? Because from the outside perspective, the New York Times is about delivering news. And so we think about reporters and we think about people, you know, photographers getting the news. So uh, Mark Thompson, our um, CEO, talks about it as this pyramid. And you have the journalists who sit at the top. And our job as a, um, as a um, organization, um, all of us who support them in this pyramid, our job is to take the reporting that they do out um, in the field and bring it to people where they where they um, need it, and and informing people with the information um, that they want and and need to hear. 
Um, so there's, you know, we have a journalist in something like 44 foreign um, bureaus, um, and they're all um, over the the uh, world. And our job is 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 to take that content that they write, build, and get it out there. Uh, we are the new. Uh, we are the new paper. We are that distribution. Um, so uh, the reporting is obviously like this is the you know arguably some of the best of uh, best um, content in the world. Our job is to say, okay, this is awesome. How can we make it reach the most people and make the most impact? So your job then. So the role of. So you're creating content. And now you're thinking about that content as, as, as basically part and pulse, part and parcel of multiple distribution channels. And so the print paper is one of those, but now equal standing are the web, the uh, devices, and so forth. Exactly, exactly. Now, where do, first off, I was going to say, where do APIs come into this? But very briefly, maybe just give us a layperson's definition of when you talk about APIs, what does that actually mean? So all in them API is, is it's a interface to a machine system. So it's a way of expressing um, to a, a computer, an application, some, some sort of program telling it, uh, this is the content that I want, um, this is the content uh, that I want you to store or have. It's, you know, same as, you know, when you open up, um, uh, you know, a application like Photoshop, that's a um, interface to manipulate um, images. APIs are ways to uh, manipulate systems. So when you say manipulate systems, um, again, for those of us who are, who are, sure. who are just not technologists at all. Tell us what you mean, and, and just you know, give us an example. Totally. So um, you know, we have a system that's a basically a, um, a CMS. Um, it's called Scoop, um, and that system has some APIs that allow other uh, systems to give it um, articles, give it information about different things, and also pull that um, information out. Um, so all it is is a way for you know for you know something like Scoop, other systems say like um, our website. Um, it's a way for for the website to say, hey, I want to show this um, article. So it makes a, a a call and says, hey, let's just grab that, and then it decides how it wants to show it. Okay, so you've essentially broken your system up into many pieces. Right? Is that is that a fair yeah. way to describe it? Yeah. So any enterprise um, these days to iterate on uh, building software, um, you have to split up your systems at some point. Um, there's arguments, you know, that you can continue building with one system, but you know, 400 people can't work on the same system all the time. It just doesn't work. Um, so what ends up happening is you end up with all these different um, services um, that can be independently built um, and um, and um, independently changed, uh, and they interact through um, APIs. So maybe I have an article service and I have an author um, service, and the author service pulls information from the author um, service to add information to um, articles, things like that. Um, Maybe maybe those are two physically different teams, and we can improve both of those products some independently or not at all. Okay, so you've broken it up into these, can we say microservices to use? That's a loaded term, but yes. Um. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now so the, so the New York Times has got all of these, pieces and some of them are yep. graphics and some are images and some are recipes headlines exactly. is that is that an accurate way of thinking about the times so if you just look at our homepage um, of the times uh, you can see you know at the very top you see weather 
that's a um, API. Uh, you see the uh, watching feed on the right-hand side. Um, that's a um, API. Uh, there's a link to crosswords, advertisements. That's a um, API. Um, recommendations, another one. Um, you know the you know it takes you know we um, estimate that to create the New York Times experience, you're talking to between 40 and 50 different services. Um, and those are 40, 50 different um, APIs um, to, to build all of that content. So we have now the, essentially the building blocks of the New York Times, right? That's what you're describing. Yeah. So we have the building blocks of the API, of the, of the Times, and the APIs are and so what's, what's the role, now we have these building blocks, what's the role of the APIs? The role of the um, APIs is, is these are the ways that when we build a new um, iOS app, when we build a new um, Android app, we're going to leverage these same services. Um, so you build the website once um, and you know, then you want to build the um, Android app you can leverage these same services to build that new, um, that, that new app. It can look completely a different, it's gonna operate very differently, but at the end of the day, it's calling into all of those same services. Um, so as you build more and more of these reusable services, you can build new products faster. So, all right. So this is, I have to say, it's, it's really interesting because, of course, somebody who has, like, like, I guess most of us watching, who have grown up with the New York Times thinking just, you know, we don't think about the components in this way, yeah. you're describing the building block. So, okay, so we've got our weather service or component or whatever the term is we want to use. And, yeah. and we have our articles and, and our recipes. So, so you have decomposed what we usually think of as our morning newspaper into these, these pieces. So first off, what's the language you use? What are each of these pieces called? Uh, what are, so uh, we describe a, someone who is using a um, API as a consumer and someone who's providing one as a provider. Um, and it's sometimes a consumer is also a uh, providing, um, actually oftentimes that's the case. Um, but it's this relationship of who is making the call and who is receiving the call. So we have providers and, um, consumers more often, we just call the people who are using the um, APIs users. Um, and that user could be an Android app. It could be a um, iPhone app, could be the website. Okay, so, so you've got the components, you've got users, and so the users are people, or let me rephrase, so the, so the function then is trying to figure out what is the, how can we take this body of content, these providers as you call them, this body of content, and chunk it and recombine the pieces so that it's appropriate for each platform, whether it's a mobile, whether it's a phone, a website, what have you, recombine in such a way that is going to take full advantage of that particular platform, bringing the best content experience in a sense. Is that, I don't mean to put words in your mouth. No, no, exactly. So like the, um, so the um, Apple Watch, um, you know, that's a very different um, experience with very different needs than the desktop website. Um, they're just different. Um, you might not want recommendations on your wrist, but you probably want breaking news. Um, so that's, so we're able to leverage these same systems, these same ways that we've cut up um, content um, you know, morphed it into a form that is useful to us. Recommendations is a great um, example. We know what you read, so we can build a service that can, can, can say these articles, you might like them. Um, so by, by having these services available, uh, we're able to take what we need and not rebuild three different ways of doing the same thing. 
But it's not just you though, right? Because you make these services available to the world, to developers. Yeah, so there's, so there's two aspects to um, that. If you go to um, developer.newyorktimes.com, you can try out a lot of the um, APIs um, that are public. So you can do things like searching for um, articles, you can get comments, uh, there's top stories, find out what's most popular, um, and it gives you the, opportun the um, opportunity to build experiences uh, with our content. Um, uh, but in addition to that, we've been providing that content uh, forever. Um, newspapers have always done this. Um, and, uh, you know, there's, they're actually one of the first sort of like content API providers where you would actually, you know, fax or send on the wire or, you know, mail, send by person copies of the written stories. So the um, AP Great example, that's kind of all they do. Um, other people print what they write. Um, and we print their stuff, they print our stuff. Um, so these sort of big, uh, in addition to big media, but also small ones too, you know, a tiny a newspaper um, can also grab that content and, re uh, and use it in their paper. Um, so APIs, these external ones, they're just a different way of, of giving people the um, opportunity to use that content. So, so the APIs then create efficiency because in the past, right, as you say, we've, you know, people have been sharing newspaper articles, but this now allows developers to do it in a, in a systematic and very efficient way. Are there yep. interesting examples that you can point to of how people are using these APIs? Uh, sure. Yeah. Um, so a lot of the people who actually use them are, are um, typically uh, uh, researchers who are trying to find patterns. Um, there's been a lot of cool um, like views of, of taking our uh, content. You know, we have 165 years of it and saying, OK, how has the spoken word changed um, or, you know, what has you know, what stories have been popular, you know, between like 1940 and 1970. Um, and they do cool things with that. Um, but we have a lot of people who, uh, who use it on their uh, websites. They, they, they want, okay, here are all the articles about this certain topic, um, you know, for people to, uh, to, um, to um, actually read. Um, and there's people who, use our um, APIs without ever actually um, interacting. Um, there's something called um, IFTTT, if this, then that. Um, we're one of the top chefs um, on that site and people actually integrate with us uh, point and click and, and they can build their own emails. They can you know, have it go into their um, Evernote. Um, whatever way that's interesting that, that that, that they want to interact with our uh, content. Um, we have uh, public um, libraries that use our bestsellers list um, to programmatically decide what books to buy. Um, there's been a lot of interesting uh, uses and we're always looking uh, to uh, both learn from our uh, users what they want um, and also take those um, experiences and, um, and uh, bring them back to our main uh, products. Now, you also, you think about your APIs, and I say your APIs because you're the person who's designing these APIs, architecting them. You yeah. think about these APIs in a very direct way as supporting the core mission of the Times. And so, again, maybe just restate what that core mission is and explain what in the world does that have to do with APIs or vice versa? <laughs> Sure. So uh, the core mission um, of the Times is to enhance um, society by creating, collecting, and distributing high-quality content, um, basically. Um, and uh, so we're really um, the our um, APIs most of uh, most um, of the time are involved in that distribution um, angle. Um, sometimes they're used in creating new uh, new 
um, experiences, um, but most of the time they're used for distributing that, um, that, that great um, content. Um, and without them, uh, it'd be very hard for us to create a lot of different um, information where people want it. So our mission isn't to just print, like make a, a newspaper or to, um, or, uh, to just give you it in the static form. We want to inform you and give you the news and um, information in whatever way makes the most sense for you. So our cooking website, you know, all our cooking website started off as is a realization that, hey, we have 17,000 recipes um, dating back to the 1800s. I wonder if anyone would be interested in actually using those. And because we had a, a service that um, already stored all of that, they were um, able to say, okay, I'm just going to pull down all of these, um, all of these, um, all of these um, recipes and try to work with them. Um, and that's the kind of experience you can build and reuse um, when you've already built these uh, services. Um, and it allows us to rapidly build new, um, new ways of, of spreading this news. So the APIs, in a sense, also represent organizational boundaries, right? Because you're, you're building APIs for weather and you must have a team of people that manages the weather. You're building APIs for recipes or what have you. So the APIs are kind of a programmatic embodiment of, of the organization. Is that, would you, what do you think about that? Yeah. Um, so, you know, there's, there, there, there's this term called um, a Conway's law, uh, which is this thought that um, uh, your, your code and your programs reflect your team structure. Um, and APIs are the most direct way of saying, hey, there's a boundary of teams. That's the edge of your structure is I build a, I'm an API for your team to use. Um, so a lot of the time, that's, that's the majority of the way teams interact is they will go to another team and say, hey, you know, we wanna use this piece of content, we wanna use this service you built, let me integrate with that. Um, let me take your thing you built um, and actually go and use it. So APIs are the boundary and they're the service that teams offer to other teams. Um, so, uh, you know, which, you know, brings about the fact that if your APIs aren't very good um, and they're not well designed, not well documented, um, and they're hard for, for these teams to actually leverage, they either won't um, or if they have to, they're they're going to be pretty mad about it. Um, and I've and I've seen at a lot of orgs um, that that builds real friction um, because the API might not have even been that team's fault. Um, APIs last forever. You know, when when you build one, people start using it. That API can stick around for a very long time. Um, oftentimes longer than the systems that um, it was built for. Um, so, you know, those interactions can be pretty bad. You know, people are like, I don't know how to use this. You're not helping me. Um, this was, you know, that breeds actual um, animosity between teams. Uh, when in the event that a team has a great, great um, documentation, you, you know exactly how to use it, you really appreciate it. You're like, oh, this, like this was great. I know how to use this, and you tend to like those people more, um, all because of a system they built and how you were able to leverage it. So you construct the. So when, at some pure point, at say time zero, in the past, yeah. where there were no APIs, the. APIs that are built reflect the structure of the information, and as you said, Conway's law reflect the structure of the teams creating that information. At that time. At, yeah. that, at that moment, at that beginning point. Yeah. 
And you have to keep those APIs around because people may want to use them. So, so what about the evolution process of the APIs? And how do you manage that inside the New York Times? Because I'm assuming you also want to get rid of APIs because you want to, I was going to say, I was going to say force, but let's, let's say gently encourage, or maybe it is force, gently encourage people to use the information in a particular way. Maybe the Times has come up with new usage guidelines. Maybe there's new types of information. Maybe you figured out better ways that the jigsaw puzzle can piece together. Yeah. So what do you do? How do you handle so, that? This is what I refer to as the um, API life cycle. Um, APIs are born, uh, they are built, they are used, and then all APIs must eventually die. Um, and that's something that's really hard um, because uh, we can, when we first build a new service or system, we never want to think about that. We never want to think about this end state where this thing that I spent all this time building and we put a lot of resources in, it will eventually die. And that's almost the most important part of using any um, API is understanding that this will not be here forever. It might change, um, it might be um, improved, or the thing that's powering it uh, might no longer be here. Um, so, uh, you know, that's why, you know, you know, we are, are, are building processes um, and building basically uh, just like understandings of, okay, I have this some um, API um, that I want to go and use. And instead of just integrating with it so that it works, I make sure that my app uh, can, in the event that I won't be able to um, update it um, later on, let's say it's an um, iOS app, um, people never have to actually update it. Um, it could go and live on for literally years. And we've actually seen that happen. Um, we have to make sure that in that app, if my um, API uh, dies and I can no longer use it, that I can offer a sane um, experience to that user. Um, now, if someone has an old version, uh, an old version um, of our app, been there for like a year, and they go to re-engage with the times. They haven't um, updated it because they haven't been um, using it. They open up that app and it breaks. It just fails because that API is dead. And that oftentimes is what happens if you don't plan for, um, for, um, for um, these things. Well, that user, what's the likelihood that they haven't touched us in a year um, and now the, their one um, interaction is you cr crashing your app on their phone. Um, or worse, it doesn't immediately crash, it looks like it's working, and then it just like breaks or gives something um, unexpected, like an actual error code to the user. Um, those are things that you never want to happen, um, but can happen and do. Um, so the API lifecycle is all about, okay, let me plan in my app. What am I going to do? Let me. Uh, what am I going to do when this API is dead? What am I going to tell the user? How am I? Sh maybe it's as simple as telling the user you should probably upgrade because this app is out of date. Um, thinking about things like that um, at that um, integration point, and not you know a year down the line when that um, API you know inevitably dies. So, uh, so you're really thinking almost from the beginning about the obsolescence of the APIs that you're creating and what's going to be the impact. Exactly. Like the only thing that we can be sure of is that technology is going to change um, and our business needs are going to change. If anything has taught newspapers in the past, you know, 20 years, is that businesses, business models change and we can't count on the same things that worked, you know, 10, um, 10, 10, five, even one year in the past, you know, things are, things are changing rapidly. So we, so like from the offset, we need to make sure that we are planning uh, with that in mind. What's the hardest part 
about designing APIs at, at a place like the New York Times? So the hardest part about um, the hardest part is 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 not designing new um, APIs. That's actually the that's like that's kind of the easy part because today um, you know the uh, New York Times has tons of really really smart people um, and you know they want to build really good things. Um, you know the the challenge is when when you're building something new to just put in the time to actually design it, think about it, um, share with the stake um, holders about how this thing might work, getting their um, input, um, and then actually building it. Um, that's almost the that's almost the easy part. the The challenging parts are how do we deal with old things? How do we update old things? Um, because, you know, we've had a website for over 20 years now, and we have services that have existed for, you know, I think the oldest that I'm aware of is, uh, that's still in use in some uh, capacity is over 16 years old. Um, like that's really legacy tech. Um, and, you know, the challenging parts is how do we deal with that both from a, from a, a consumer side and from a and from a, a provider side how do we migrate that to uh, something else how do we kill it when no one was was thinking about that death at the time how how do we make that less painful um, and things like that and how about from an organizational standpoint because when you're building these APIs, and you mentioned Conway's law earlier, when you're building these APIs, in effect, you are memorializing how different parts of the organization work, and, and you're describing uh, the boundaries, in a sense, that and the silos around what different parts of the organization do and are responsible for those teams. So how does, how does that come into play, or does it come into play, does it not? Come into play. It comes into play. Um, it's a matter of there's a lot of talk um, about at that stage of, of how do we decide who um, who like which system should own this new feature, um, which team is responsible for you know this new thing, um, where should it live, and because we had those conversations and we don't just smack it onto anything. Um, the hope is that we'll make a good one um, and we'll put it in the best worst place. Um, you know, uh, because oftentimes there, there, there isn't necessarily a best option, um, but, you know, we want to minimize that um, impact. And, you know, that's the move towards uh, micro um, services. Uh, we're rapidly, you know, moving to make our, our services smaller. Um, and that means more um, APIs. But as your services get smaller, it's easier for you to have, um, you know, s at least smaller silos, um, and there to be less of a cost to build something small, put it out there, get people using it, um, and then iterate on that. Because you can move things between teams. Um, move, uh, move the, uh, move the um, ownership is a lot easier when it's really small. And I built this, you know, let's say I built a small feature um, and it turns out my team shouldn't own it. Um, it's not really relevant, but if I built it in this small way, the, the team or the system that should own that, it's less of a cost for them to say, okay, we we will build something that does exactly that. We'll just do it in um, our thing, and people can just start using this new uh, system. You know, we can just switch them out. Um, but if it's larger, uh, if it's more complex, that's a lot harder to do. Um, granted, these are enterprise problems. You know, where uh, where we face real enterprise problems um, for a smaller company, that probably doesn't make sense. Um, if you have three developers and you're building an app, if you have 20, if you have 100, um, building services this small doesn't make nearly as much sense, especially when you don't have, you know, 20 years of legacy systems. Um, and that's like, that's the big, 
you know, differentiator is like when you're at this larger scale, these things matter more. Um, when, when, you know, and we kind of have a business model that kind of works. It's kind of worked for like, you know, you know, centuries at this point. Um, you know, when you're a small startup and you don't even know um, how you're going to like make money, don't focus on where, which service your API should live in. You should probably just ship your code. Um, and and uh, think about this stuff from the perspective of let's make sure that that, that 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 the API that I design is at least good, not necessarily where it lives, um, because when you know a bigger company comes and says I want to integrate with you guys, send me your um, API, you will be judged on that, um, and that's a big deal. Because when you're small, you can't build a, uh, you know, you can't necessarily build new systems all the time. You want to um, integrate um, and building APIs that you can eventually make public um, is a great way of doing that. Now, in order to build these APIs, don't you have to have a very detailed understanding of the type of content that you're putting the API on? as well as the intention behind that type of content, as well as how that content fits into the broader scheme. So you have to have real expertise on the subject matter of the, you know, the part of the newspaper that you're constructing the API around, right? Yeah, you have to at least uh, you know, get as good of an understanding as you can. Um, you'll never know it all, and you will never um, be able to for sure build the right abstraction. Um, however, if you meet with enough people who are using it, enough people who um, who who have you know built similar systems that know this a uh, domain, um, you can at least get something that's mostly right. And if you think about that API lifecycle where you can kill this later, you can do a new a new um, version. You can change it. Um, it doesn't have to be forever if you're thinking about that from 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 really day one. And what about uh, you're working with the subject matter experts in the various parts of the Times? Um, how closely do you work with them? How much support do they give you? Do they how do they think it's do they understand the importance of it? Do they think it? Oh, this is just this technical thing. Um, what's the what's what's what are those relationships like? I'm sure they're good relationships, but give us some yeah. insight into how that all works. So, um, one thing ab um, about the Times is everyone is incredibly nice. Um, uh, you know, it's a large um, organization, but like uh, other uh, departments are, are normally more than willing to help out, um, figure out sort of like what that partnership should be. Um, good examples of the teams that actually work hand in hand with, 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 with those, um, experts are our uh, cooking team. They work directly with, uh, our, um, editor for, uh, food. Our uh, games team works with our uh, crossword um, people. Um, they're working hand in hand to get an understanding of both the product needs and uh, what they, where they envision this data should go and and how it should work. Um, you know, examples of, uh, of some really hard APIs to build um, was the cooking um, recipes are an incredibly hard domain to model um, because you have this sort of unlimited, you know, sizes like, uh, you know, like a dash of sugar. Um, how do you represent that when it's, it's actually a metric of size, but at the same time, it's, it's like, can you have two dashes of something like those sorts of things? Um, and also, you, you know, just representing, uh, you know, food and recipes. Um, can be really hard, and uh, that's why we uh, push people to spend as much time up front designing these um, interfaces, thinking about them, um, and not think about building it until you've actually decided, okay, 
how am I going to model this? What do like, what does a recipe look like in my system? And those are the sorts of uh, decisions that, uh, that teams of all sizes should be putting that time into. Um, because when, you know, you, what you're doing is you're investing upfront and, uh, building an experience, um, to work with that data, um, making that as that as easy and seamless as possible, and it's going to be less likely down the road that someone's going to, you know, either complain or uh, need a system that looks differently if you've done the work up front um, to really model it correctly. So let's uh, talk just a little bit more about cooking, which, of course, the New York Times cooking. I remember when you released it as a when you released the cooking app and redid everything about cooking and it's so great. Yeah. Right. I mean, I use it every night. Um. Yeah. Right. I mean, it's fantastic. So how do you work? What's the role of the cooking staff, the recipe staff versus the role of the API staff in figuring out how to model that? So it's um, it's really comes down to the 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 team that actually builds that uh, cooking app. They're they're the ones who actually sit down and make the decision on sort of how that works. Because um, at the end of the day, technologists are most likely going to know best about um, how um, what the uh, technical experience is that will work best for that domain, um, but it, it's, but working with those domain experts in cooking recipes allows them to have a, have a great understanding of that content and do a little bit of anticipation of, okay, uh, you know, I'm going to model this this way because I know that recipes sometimes look like this. Um, and we might, you know, add new ways of presenting recipes or sizes and, um, and, uh, measurements and things like that. So they really have to be, um, you know, in a way experts, um, in how that stuff works, um, and sort of how like cookbooks work. Um, cause really it's a cookbook on the internet. Um, and luckily, you know, every member um, of that team, loves cooking and it's and are really passionate um and that really feeds into a, a design that works really well so the so understanding the content and being interested in the subject matter is a significant part of designing apis well oh it it definitely helps um you know it if if you don't know what you're modeling and and you don't know what you're building, it's going to be very hard for you to know to anticipate what other people will want from your system. Um, and that's key: is your 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 desi you're designing how people are going to use information um, and use content, and the people who are requesting it they're going to know what they want and they're going to know, um, you know, from an interface standpoint, what they want that information to look like. Um, and that'll be very, uh, you're not going to do a very good job if you know less than they do. Um, so it's, it, it truly is about being, um, at least fluent in, in, in the language of what you're modeling. You know, we're, we're almost out of time, but there's one last point that I think is extremely important that I hope you can address for us. And that is for an organization that wants to encourage both adoption of its APIs, but from a broader perspective, even more importantly, for an or if an organization wants to be an, a data provider, such as the New York Times of open data, what do you have to do? What do they have to do in order to ensure that there is adoption? You can't say ensure, let's say encourage adoption. Uh, you, the key is you can't be stingy. Um, you have to just give it out. Um, when we launched our um, developer uh, portal, there was a lot of 
questions like, oh, are people going to be stealing our data? Questions like that. Don't just, just give it away. Um, and then, and you don't have to give it all, but like, don't be stingy. And, and because you will find that first off, not that many people are going to use it at first. Um, you're going to find that out. But the people who do, you're going to find those passionate people who are really interested in using your data in new ways. You look at uh, uh, companies like Slack, um, which has built their business on having great um, APIs. Um, you know, Slack is, you know, I think it got voted like one of the number one new enterprise products. Uh, we use it um, at the Times. Um, you know, they're, the reason why they're sticky is because they have APIs that allow you to integrate. So you can have all of your systems feeding into Slack. Um, and, and also going out of Slack. You know, we are building um, experiences uh, using Slack bots to talk about politics. Um, that's really interesting, but those are things that started off as just people in our um, R&D lab hacking around with um, APIs. Um, so you're enabling people outside of your org, your real users, um, to build the experience they want to have. And if you offer the um, APIs to allow them to do that, uh, they're never leaving. Because once they've integrated, they've, they just put up a lot of upfront work. Um, and it's going to be a lot harder for someone else to build something similar and get them to rebuild all of their existing um, systems. And I would be remiss if I didn't just follow up and say, okay, so as you talk about not being stingy and give it all away, are there newspaper gods up in the sky who are looking down and frowning because the newspaper business relies on, you know, it pays for that, it pays for the development of that content and relies on people buying it. And now you're advocating giving it away. So the internet, so to be clear, the, the, the information that we give is everything but article content. Um, you can search for um, articles, you can find out what's trending, you can do almost anything you want with our data through our um, APIs, with the exception of actually reading all of the content. Um, but at the end of the day, one of the best things about being a, a news creating machine uh, is that we write new content every day and we're, we are building new content and exposing it in new ways every day. Um, so, you know, if people want to take your content, they're going to, they're going to scrape your uh, website. They're going to find ways to re uh, re sell that data. Um, you're not going to be able to stop them. Um, so it, it, it's, it's really about giving people the opportunity to really interact with your content um, in ways that you've never thought of and empowering your community to figure out what they want. Um, and, you know, while, you know, we don't give our, our, our actual article text away, um, we give pretty much everything else and, uh, and people build a lot of really cool stuff on top of that. Okay. Wow. That's been really interesting. We've been talking with Scott Feinberg, who is the API architect of the New York Times. And boy, we just sure learned a lot about the New York Times and how, how it works under the covers. Scott, thank you so much for taking the time today. Thank you for having me. You have been watching episode number 161 of CXO Talk. Thank you for joining us. Thank you to Scott Feinberg from the New York Times for joining us. And everybody come back on Friday where we will be back again with another awesome show. Thanks so much, everybody. Bye-bye.